Okay, here's the question. How are we going to double our electricity usage and make it totally clean? Net zero. Net zero. Net zero. Net zero. That's the plan, but what does it really mean? Because here's the thing. Our energy is responsible for about 75% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions, but our power consumption is actually expected to double by 2050. So how do we do that without totally destroying the planet? To find out, I've been talking to lots of scientists and experts, and there is a lot. Okay, let's start with one of the nicer predictions. Now, the International Energy Agency say that by 2050, renewables could account for 90% of all of our electricity generation globally. Okay, that sounds promising. But to find out what that really means, down on the ground, I've come to a UK national grid site where they're building tunnels to prepare for future energy demand. Before we go any further, right, what is the grid? The national grid is really the highway for energy, so we move energy around the country. And in 2020, renewable energy actually outstripped that from fossil fuels, making up 43% of all the UK's energy. Here in the UK, as you can see, we have a lot of wind, and that's a really great renewable power source. But in order to get to net zero, we could need 10 times the wattage of what we currently generate with offshore wind. And that could need up to about 7,500 turbines. Our target is to connect 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, and we need a lot of infrastructure to do that. But we're also looking at what the network needs to be able to do to be more flexible for renewable energy. Because it's not just wind, all of the UK's renewables will need to increase as well. When it comes to power, one major thing we need to look at is our reliance on gas. Gas is still currently in 85% of our homes and 40% of our electricity is dependent on gas for its production. So gas still plays a huge, a huge role in the energy network. So what will replace natural gas? Well, hydrogen is a bit of a buzzword in net zero. Because in theory, burning it produces almost entirely water. I mean, it can also produce nitrous oxides, which contribute to acid rain but it doesn't produce any CO2, so largely it's considered clean energy. However, it all depends on where you get the hydrogen from. Hydrogen can be made in a number of different ways, uh, and not all of those ways are clean. So we could make hydrogen from natural gas, turning a fossil fuel into hydrogen, but if we make hydrogen from natural gas and capture the carbon that's emitted during that process, then it can be very much more clean. Yeah, so what's often left out of the conversations around hydrogen right now is that 96% of it is made from fossil fuels. And even if you capture the carbon that's produced during that process, it's still 20% more carbon emitting than simply burning gas for heat. So it's not solving a problem, is it? But hydrogen can be green if it's made from electricity and if that electricity comes from renewables. And even though that's only a fraction of how we make hydrogen today, it's not the end of the road for hydrogen because it could be a game changer for how we store renewable energy. So with renewables like wind or solar, what do you do when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining? Well, you need to have some energy in the bank. Batteries have been really, really successful in terms of storing energy, but the major issue with batteries is that they can't store uh, electricity for long periods of time. So in addition, we need long duration energy storage, or LDES for short. There are all sorts of uh, novel ways of um, storing uh, energy and electricity which are being looked into. Okay, so there's something called gravity-based energy storage. Literally by lifting and lowering heavy blocks, energy can be stored and then released when needed. Another option is electrothermal storage, where energy is stored, for example, as molten salt, which can be used to power turbines in the same way as gas and coal. You can also convert energy into compressed air and store it underground. And then there's our old friend hydrogen. Even though um, it isn't necessarily efficient or clean to generate hydrogen at the moment, what we are looking at is future technologies whereby we can generate green hydrogen from excess electricity from renewables formed through a process called electrolysis. And that would provide a really nice way of using excess power from renewables and then storing it for when it's needed. Okay, on to the big question. What's our role in all of this? Because your average individual doesn't own a power station, right? But we are part of the system. Previously, you would turn your lights on and you wouldn't know where your energy has come from. But if you think now you have smart meters 
apps that can tell you how much it, it's costing to use certain types of energy. So consumers are playing a bigger role, they're much more invested, and their behaviours are having a bigger influence on the energy network. So who's responsible for this change? Achieving net zero is going to have to be a mix of individuals taking responsibility for their own actions but also recognising that it's not going to happen if we just rely on that. There are going to have to be government policies and quite strong incentives. So there are some huge changes needed both inside the home and outside to reach net zero. But if everything goes well, we shouldn't feel a difference at home at all. Flick a switch and electricity should just flow. And be green, of course.